thank you, Renee, for turning those lights up. I do appreciate that. <laughs> Take your Bibles out. Turn with me to the second chapter of the book of Acts this morning. That's where we're going to be. This past Monday was my 50th birthday. Now, my notes said there would be cheap applause at this point, so I'm not sure if I just put that wrong in my notes. Oh, thank you. How unexpected. Oh, that's so kind. Thank you very much. I didn't want to understate it. I do thank you all for your kindness. Many of you wish me a happy birthday on Facebook, and I do appreciate that. I was just a touch disappointed, though, I have to say. I didn't get any old people jokes. Not one. Now, I'm the youngest of four, so I need to build my repertoire when all those old people have their birthdays so I can share them. I didn't get any old people jokes on my birthday. Yeah, I am the youngest of four siblings, I said. I have two older sisters, and I have a brother who is five years older than me. And for as long as I can remember, my brother and I shared a bedroom. From my furthest memory back until the day that Jeannie and I got married and I moved out of the house, my brother and I shared a room. In fact, we shared everything. We shared that space in the bedroom. We shared, when we were younger, certainly we shared the toy box that was in the bedroom. We shared the contents of the toy box that was in the bedroom. We shared clothes. When whatever he wore five years later, I was wearing we shared a bicycle. Whatever, whatever bike he had five years later was mine. You get the picture. We shared every single thing. Our sharing wasn't always voluntary. And sometimes, you know, if you've got kids, you've seen this. Sometimes we were involved, engaged in this epic battle over just that right matchbox car or that particular G.I. Joe. And we would just be going at it. And somehow my mother knew. I don't know how she knew she'd be in the other far corner of the house and somehow that mom radar would go off that the boys are fighting over something. And my mother had a voice that could cut through concrete. And we would hear her bellow from the other side of the house, share with your brother. And that's kind of the title of the message this morning, share with your brother. If you, if you have children, you may have found yourself saying that, especially if you have boys, you've found yourself saying that from time to time. And that's the title of the message this morning. Because we're continuing to look at the, how the Bible describes the church. And we have been talking about some of the titles that the Bible uses to describe the church. And this morning, as we're in Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at the very first church. That very first church that formed in Jerusalem right after the day of Pentecost. And I think if we looked at this title, what we see there is a sharing church. And Luke wouldn't have said it this way as a command like my mother did, share with your brother, but I think if he was to describe that church in Jerusalem, he would say that's something that characterizes that church. They were a sharing church. And what I want us to see out of that is what they shared. That sharing attitude, what that looked like in that first church and how God used that, not only to establish his brand new church, but also to grow his church members and to grow and to build that church. So you've got your Bibles open to Acts chapter 2. You follow along, and we'll start reading there in verse 41. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together, and they had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions, and were sharing them with all anyone who might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. And praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So I want us to look this morning at that church the sharing attitude of that church and what that looked like and then how God used that to build his people and to build his church. And I think one of the things that we noticed about that church was they shared their lives together. That was something that God was able to use, how he was able to, to build that church individually as the people of God, but then also as a group because they shared their lives together. Now, I included verse 41 in, in this section that I just read. It's not technically a part of that entire section. Verses 1 through 41 of Acts chapter 2 really describe the day of Pentecost. And verse 41 kind of rounds out that day, sort of wraps it up and puts a neat little bow. 
the, the, the disciples were preaching that day. Peter kind of took the lead and was the spokesman for the group, but it says all of them were preaching. There were people from 15 different areas, regions, and, and cities and nations that were there that day. 15 different people groups. There were 12 disciples preaching, and yet everyone heard them in their own language. And so to say that God was doing something amazing, there were awe and wonders, absolutely. Somehow those 12 were able to speak in 15 different languages at the same time. Peter took the lead, the, the gospel was preached, the Holy Spirit moved, and then we see there in verse 41 how the Spirit kind of wraps up the day of Pentecost. And for, for, So verse 41 sets the scene for us. 3,000 people came to know Christ that day. Man, what a great problem to have, right? What an amazing problem for this brand new church to have. There were 120 people, it says in, back in chapter 1, verse 15. It says there were 120 believers there in Jerusalem prior to this day. So the church explodes from 120 to 3,120 in one day. What an amazing problem to have, right? And we have some great problems here at this church, too. And we, we moved the children's, the school-age class from upstairs to downstairs. We, it, it outgrew the classroom upstairs, so we had to move it down into the sanctuary. What an amazing problem to have. And we all, we're always looking for more volunteers for the children's ministry. We have more children than we have volunteers to be able to bring the word of God to them. What an amazing problem for us to have. That means that God has brought families, has brought you here, has brought families here, given us an incredible opportunity to be able to in, input the word of God into those kids' lives. And maybe you're sitting in the congregation, you hear us talk about that, and you, you sense a little stirring, and you say, maybe God's leading me to be a part of that. Praise God for that problem we have, right? He's opening up a door, maybe, for you even to use the gifting that he's given you. In our home groups, we have home groups that are outgrowing the living rooms that they meet in. Praise God, what a, what a wonderful problem to have. We have some of those great problems, but can you imagine 3,000 new believers show up all at the same time. What an amazing problem to have. Hungry. They're, they're hungry for the word, and here they are all at once. And, and there was no church for them to go back to. They probably stayed there. We're not really told, but the they that he refers to in verse 42 is probably, largely, this 3,000 new believers. They had nowhere else to go. There was no other church. This was the only one. So there was, there were some visitors from Rome, we're told, that were there. But there was no church in Rome for them to go back to. There was no church in Egypt or Mesopotamia for them to go back to. If they were going to learn anything about this newfound faith, if they were going to learn what it means to, to live as a believer and how can I grow in the apostles' teaching, if they were going to learn any of that, it had to be there in Jerusalem. There was nowhere else for them to be. And so they were, they were staying there. The 3,000 become a big part of the they that Luke is talking about in verses 42 through 47. And there's something else I want us to understand about that church. Those 120 disciplers, those 120 core group that were already there that are identified back there in chapter 1, verse 15. I think it's easy for us to get in our minds this idea of what that group looked like. And I think it's tempting for us to think about them as these wise, mature, seasoned, and settled believers. I mean, these are the disciples and those that were in their immediate circle. And so it's easy for us to think about them in those terms. But here's what I want us to understand about that church. Not one person in that church had been a believer more than three years. Do you realize that? Not one of them. Andrew was the first disciple to be called, and, and all, shortly thereafter, he goes and grabs his brother Peter and says, hey, come on, I, I found the Messiah. They were the first two, but that was three years ago. Not one person in that first church had been a believer longer than three years, and many of them had been saved just a matter of a few months. Now, what enabled them to be effective disciples? What enabled God to work through them in such a way that he was able to establish his church and to grow his church with such an immature crowd, such, such a crowd of new believers? Look again there at verse 42. What they were doing. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They were persistent. That's what that word, continually devoting themselves. It means they were persistent. 
They were persistent in their pursuit of the apostles' teaching. It was the apostles' teaching that brought them to Christ. The Spirit stirred something in their hearts as they heard the gospel preached, and they were drawn to that. And there was a, a persistence about being in and around what the apostles had to say. Now, you and I don't have the apostles that show up here at the church on a, on a regular basis. There are no apostles today. That office ended in, in the church age. But we have the apostles' teaching. They were passionate about it. And listen, they weren't content with, with a casual interaction with what the apostles had to say. Let me sit around you for just a few hours, maybe, maybe even just 30 minutes, and I'll hear a little of the apostles' teaching, and then I'll go out and I'll go about my day and I'll go about my week, and, and stuff gets tough, and things get hard, and at the end of my rope, well, then I'll come back and I'll listen to the apostles again. They weren't content with that. That casual interaction with the Word of God, that wouldn't do. They had a hunger an insatiable hunger for the disciples' teaching. And Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And that characterized that early church. They didn't have all the answers. They didn't know all of the right responses to every single situation, but they knew where they could find it. And they were passionate about being involved in what the apostles were teaching, what the word of God had to say. They simply couldn't get enough of it. And they did that together. Did you catch that? They were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Now, you can't have fellowship by yourself. The fellowship, the word there is the Greek word koinonia. It means community. You can't be in community by yourself. You can't have fellowship by yourself. By definition, that's in a group. They were devoted to both of those things, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Now, am I suggesting that armed with just a hunger for the word of God, that you could be effective in helping someone grow in their relationship with Christ if, you've, if you're not Billy Graham? or you've not been a believer for 10 or 20 years, maybe you've only been a believer for three years, maybe even less than that. And, and am I suggesting that aren't with just a hunger for the word of God and the desire for community among God's people that you could be effective in helping someone else grow in their faith? Yeah, I think I just did suggest that. Because that's exactly what God did. He used these young disciples armed with nothing but a hunger for the word of God and a hunger to be in this together, to iron sharpens iron. He, he used them to be effective disciple makers. Now, some of us who have been believers a long time, 10, 15, 20 years, we, we, there's, there's a tendency to lose a little something as we've been in the faith for a while. And what we lose, not our salvation, we certainly don't lose that, what we lose is a tendency to be transparent, a tendency to be open. And there's something about if you've been saved for a long time where, where maybe you don't want to admit that after 10 or 15 years you still struggle with sin. You say, I don't want to admit that to a younger believer. I don't want to admit my pride will not allow me to admit that I'm still struggling with sin, even after all these years as a believer. Or maybe after a while you, you don't want to admit there are parts of the Bible that you've never read. And you, you've had that conversation with somebody where they, they're excited and passionate about a passage of Scripture, and they're sharing it with you, and you give that sort of knowing smile, but in your mind you're thinking, I have no idea what you're talking about. And after a while, you don't want to admit you've never read the second half of Leviticus. Right? You start reading it, you get about halfway through, and you say, I can't take another law. And so you jump to the New Testament, but you never jump back. You've never read the second half of Leviticus. Or you've never read the book of Obadiah. Or before today, you didn't know there was a book of Obadiah. After a while, maybe you, do, maybe you don't want to admit those things. New believers didn't have that. New believers had this desire for community. Why? They knew they needed each other in their growth. This is what I imagine it looked like in that early church. As they shared a meal together, they talked about what the apostles had taught that day. Do you remember when Peter said this today? Man, what did that mean? What was he talking about? And as they sat around that table and they shared that community together, they talked about what they had learned that day. And as questions came up, as they asked the 120, listen, you've been a believer six months. You've got a six-month head start on me. 
And as they asked them that question, they, what does this mean? That disciple, they may not have had the answer, and they were perfectly comfortable saying, you know what, I don't know. But let's go back. Let's go back and ask Peter what he meant. Let's go back and find out from the apostles what they meant by that. And what does that look like for you and me? To be able to interact with someone, and even if you only have a 10-day or a 10-week or even just a 10-month head start on them, to be involved in their lives and be able to say, you know what, I don't know the answer, but I know where I can find it. Let's go find it together. That's what I think that looked like in that first church. And as they interacted together, as they had challenges in life, as they experienced difficulties, they, they didn't look to the, to the more mature believer and say, I'm certain you don't have problems in your life. And that those more mature believers didn't put on any facade that they got it all right all the time. And I imagine as they had challenges in life, as situations came up, they said, you know what? I'm struggling with that too. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. That's what I think that looked like in that first church. They shared their lives together. Jesus held up a child as the model of childlike faith. Not childish faith, childlike faith. Those are two, two very different things. And when a child is excited about something, you're going to hear about it, right? You're going to hear all about it. Yeah, you're right. You're going to hear every single thing when a child is excited. And they're not afraid to ask questions, right? They're not afraid to admit they don't have all the answers. They don't know how all this stuff works together. Jesus held that up as the model of faith. Does it have that childlike faith, that endless curiosity about who God is and what he's doing, that ability and that willingness to say, I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers, but let's go to the one who does. That church in Jerusalem, that sharing church, they openly shared their lives together. They shared themselves with one another, very real and, and open and transparent way. And God worked in and through their community, both to build them individually and then to build them as a church. They shared their lives. The other thing they shared, verses 44 and 45, was they shared what they had, their resources. They shared their stuff, not just their lives, but they shared the resources that God had given them. Verse 44, and all who had believed were together and they had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Now, there's some, something important for us to keep in mind when we read the New Testament, and particularly the book of Acts. The book of Acts covers a bit of a transition period, a transition period from the, the earthly ministry of Jesus to what we commonly call the church age. And throughout the book of Acts, God is establishing his church, He's establishing the apostles as the authority to, to be able to teach and guide that church. And then he's also bringing the Holy Spirit on all of those believers that may have those 120 that believed before Jesus ascended. Remember, he said the Holy Spirit's not going to come until I ascend. He's, he's bringing the Holy Spirit on all of those believers. There's a transition that happens in the book of Acts. Now, the reason I bring that up is not everything in the book of Acts is intended to be exactly duplicated in the modern church. We have, to, we have to look at what happens here in the book of Acts and say, is this taught anywhere else in the New Testament? As we have all of those letters to the churches in the New Testament, is this particular thing taught in exactly this way in the rest of the New Testament? And if it is, being involved, being Hungry for the apostles' teaching and fellowship and prayer. That's taught everywhere to every church. That is intended to be duplicated exactly like that. But is everything in the book of Acts that way? And we read verses 44 and 45, and there's a bit of a communal living kind of environment there, right? They bring everything that they have, they sell it all, and they, and they divvy it up as anyone has needs. There's a bit of a communal living that's talked about in verses 44 and 45. But we don't see that taught anywhere else in the New Testament. So why is that there? Why are we told that then? And though we don't see that, we're not expected to duplicate that in all churches for all time. There is a principle there for us to pull out. What God told us that for a reason. And what's the principle we can apply to our church today? And the principle is the idea of sharing the blessings that God has given us. 
having that willing spirit, and that willing heart, that generous spirit that they had to share whatever I have, whatever is mine is yours, that kind of idea. I'm willing to share his blessings, share his physical resources. And the reality is that most of us have too much stuff. We, and especially if you're an American, we know we have too much stuff. We're reminded every three or four years when that PCS time comes up again, how much stuff we have accumulated and how much, too much of it. We have it in storage rooms, boxes we haven't touched in three or four years. And we say, what is in that thing? Most of us simply have too much stuff. James chapter one, verse 17 says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Even that stuff, even the stuff in the box that you haven't opened in the last three years, that is a gift from the hand of God. He has given us everything that we have, everything that's stored in our storage room, everything that's out in our house that we use on a regular basis, every penny that is in our bank account, God has given it all to us. Everything is a gift from Him. And then James goes on, verse 27 of James chapter 1. He talks about what it will look like in our lives. When Christ has genuinely changed our heart and how that will play out in our lives. And this is what he says it's going to look like. All those good and perfect gifts that God has given you, he said you'll use them to look after orphans, look after widows in their distress. Last week we talked about the, the difference in a, in a disciple of being a bucket versus being a hose. Being something that just collects the, the teachings of God's word or are you a conduit? a pass-through for the teachings of God. And that is true in our spiritual life, and it's also true with the physical resources that God has given us. And that's what we see there in that first church. They shared their stuff. Verse 44 said he, they had all things in common. Now, they were from 15 different places, 15 different cultural groups, 15 different language groups. They didn't have a lot of those kinds of things in common. Culturally, language-wise, they didn't have those things in common. That means that it was everything else they had in common. They had a spiritual heritage now. They were all believers. They had that in common. But that means that everything that they had, here's what I took away from that, they had all things in common. Nothing was off limits. If I have it and you need it, here, take it from me. Nothing was off limits to those in the church. In verse 45, he points to the, the generosity of their hearts. Listen, if you have a need, I'll gladly get rid of what I have so that I can meet that need. That was the sharing attitude in this church. I mentioned earlier that we're going to Moldova in about a month. The 5th through the 12th of November, we're taking a team there to Moldova as we have for the last several years. And next week, we're taking a special offering for that. And, and I mentioned I was going to tell you a little bit more about Moldova because here is a place where this principle of sharing our stuff among the needy, being able to bring a cup of cool water in the name of Christ, being able to give to the least of these, here's a place where this principle applies perfectly. Moldova is the poorest country in Europe. The average income throughout the, the country, this includes even those who live up in the capital city of Chisinau who might have a, a good, decent, solid job with a big company. The average monthly income in Moldova is $230 a month. Now, most of us have spent that on the phone that we carry around in our pocket. That's the average monthly income in the country of Moldova, the equivalent of $230. And we will be working in the Krihana Vekje village. And in that village, it's some, of the most, some of the poorest people in the country of Moldova, many of those, the ones that we'll be working with, they, they live on a government pension, kind of like Social Security. And that government pension is about $60 a month. So can you imagine? They've got a family, two, three, four kids. And they've got to provide for that family with $60 a month. And they've got to buy firewood for their homes. That's the only way they can heat them, with $60 a month. And that's where we come in. For the past five years, we've been involved in this mission project where we're collecting money. We send it on to the church that we work with there in the village, Krihanabeke Baptist Church. We send the money on to them, they collect it up, they buy firewood, and they chop it up for us. And then when our teams come, part of what we're doing in the home visits is we're bringing piles of firewood for them. It also enables us to bring a little bag of food so we can, we can bring them something to get them through for the next week or so. That takes about 25,000 euro to sustain that whole, to meet all the needs that we are, are trying to meet. It takes about 25,000 euro to meet them all, to get them through the entire winter. 
And this year we have about 12,000 already, but we need to raise the rest. To get them through, winter will end around March time frame. To get them through the end of March, we need to raise the rest. You know, we look at this church in Jerusalem, and we see this generous sharing spirit, how they shared all of their stuff. And we, and we said, what did God do in that church? They shared their lives, they shared their stuff, and what did God do through all of that? Jump down to verse 47 for just a minute. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Listen, that's what God's doing in Moldova. It's been more than firewood. It's been more than bags of food. I've gone twice. Is that right? I've gone twice? Yeah, I've gone twice now. And the last, it's just a total of the last two years of num the number of people who have come to Christ through something as simple as a pile of firewood and a bag of food, there's been almost 200 people that have come to Christ in the last two years. And I imagine it's been that way. We've been, we've been involved in this for almost five years. I imagine it's been that way every year, about 100 people every year coming to Christ, year by year, mission trip by mission trip. Stick of firewood by stick of firewood, the Lord is adding to his numbers, adding to his kingdom those who were being saved. As God shared their, as God's people shared their lives, they shared their blessings. We see how God worked through all of that. So let me ask you to pray about two things. First, how the Lord would lead you and your family to be involved in that Moldova offer. Well, would you pray about that? Our team is set, and we're going to meet with them today, and we're going, to, we're going to make sure everybody's all solid. Our team is set to go, but we need folks to give next week. Would you pray about whether you and your family can do that, how much the Lord might press on your heart to give towards that need? We also need folks to pray. While we're there, every day, if you would commit to pray for us, pray for that team, pray for those folks that we're ministering to, we need folks to do both of those things. Would you pray about being involved in that? And the second thing I'd ask you to pray about, concerning the things that God has given us, would you pray about what I'm going to call taking the tithe challenge? Not the tithe challenge, that's ridiculous, but taking the tithe challenge. Malachi 3.10 says this, bring your tithe to the storehouse. And by the way, that passage of Scripture, Malachi 3.10, that is the only place in Scripture that God not only gives us permission to test Him, He invites us to test Him. Listen to what else he said. He said, bring all of your tithes to the storehouse. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and bless you. Let me issue this challenge. Would you pray about this? If you're not already a tithing family, tithe means 10%. You say, I don't see how we're having a hard time making it on 100%. I don't have any idea how we're going to make it on 90%. Let me issue you this challenge. Would you commit to tithe for six months? Six-month period of time. Take God at his word. Step out in faith. Take, him in, take that, that promise that he made. Make that real in your life. Would you commit to tithe for six months? And here's the, here's the promise I make to you. That at the end of that six months, now I don't know how God's going to bless you, but I know that he will. But at the end of that six months, if you can come to me and honestly say, I took God at his word and he didn't bless me, if you can honestly say that, I will resign as pastor of this church that day. Not only that, I will resign from Christian ministry. Do you know why? Because that means that the promise of God in Malachi 3.10 cannot be trusted. And if the promise of God in Malachi 3.10 cannot be trusted, it begs the question if John 3.16 can be trusted. And if the Bible, if the word of God cannot be trusted, then what are we doing? Take the tithe challenge. Because tithing and giving to missions, that's so much more than bringing firewood to folks in Moldova. And that's so much more than, than building up the, the church's ability to meet the budget. Those are secondary effects, secondary benefits. Here's the benefit of giving. Here's the benefit of tithing. It's about you taking God at his word. It's about you stepping out in faith and trusting God to do what he said he's going to do. It's about acknowledging our dependence on him, that God, you've given me all of this. I can't believe you're going to give me this. Call me to tithe and then drop me like a hot potato. It's acknowledging our dependence on God for everything that we have. And it's watching God do something in your life that you didn't think could be done. That's what giving is about. That's what tithing is about. Listen, God doesn't need our money. 
God doesn't need anything from us. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He owns it all. He created it all. He doesn't need a nickel from us. And yet he calls us to give. This is about us growing in our faith. Jeremiah 17, 7 says, Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. God took that kind of faith in that Jerusalem church, that sharing their lives kind of faith, building their foundation on the word of God. And he took that faith, that sharing their stuff kind of faith in that first church, and he built on it. He built the members of that church. He built his church out of that. And the last thing I want us to know is very quickly is that they shared not only their lives, they shared not only the resources and the stuff that God had given them, but they shared in God's blessings. Verses 46 and 47. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Very quickly, let me go through what the blessings are that they experienced. When they, when they shared themselves, when they shared the things that God had given them, God blessed that church. Let me very quickly just list out the blessings that they experienced. First of all, they experienced the blessing of unity. Now, not uniformity. We all think exactly the same. We all dress the same. We all act the same. That's not unity. Unity is they were of one mind, is what Luke said. They were of one purpose. We may not always see eye to eye on the how, but we do see eye to eye on the what. Our purpose was the same. They, they experienced the blessing of unity. They experienced the blessing of gladness. He said they did these things, took their meals together, broke bread, continued with one mind with gladness. There was a genuine sense of the joy of the Lord. Watching what he was doing, there was a gladness among those people. And sincerity, with sincerity of heart. When they opened their lives to one another, and they said, listen, if you have need, I'm here. If there's any way I can meet it, I'll meet it for you. You know what that fostered in that community? It fostered a sense of trust. I know you've got my back, and you know that I've got yours. There was a, a sincerity in that church. <clears throat> and there was a genuine worship. As they looked around and they saw what God had done, bringing those 3,000 in, and they saw what God was doing. There was a genuine sense of worship. They were praising God day by day. And it not only changed them, but it changed people around them. They were experiencing favor with the people in town. People noticed what was happening among these people. Jesus said, they will know, they will know, outsiders, unbelievers, they will know you are my disciples, how? by your love for one another. That's exactly what they saw. And I already mentioned this one. God was using them day by day to build his church. Day, every single day, more and more were coming. More believers were coming to that church. You know, I have to say, as I think about our church and how we compare to the Jerusalem church, we are a loving church. We are a sharing, giving, compassionate church. But like every other church, we can grow. We can grow individually, we can grow as a church body in these areas. And I guess my question for you today would be, how would the Lord have you grow in sharing your life, opening up and being transparent, sharing your life with someone else? How would the Lord have you grow in that area? How would he have you to grow in sharing your riches, sharing the, the material resources, the blessings that God has given you so that we can experience more and more? In a few moments, we're going to gather around the Lord's table. And that's one of the incredible blessings that we have as the people of God. That we can gather around this table and the privilege of celebrating as a family what Christ has done for us. And we come to the Lord's table. We see what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, in the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body for you. And that's our celebration. As we come around the table, we can celebrate what Christ has done for us. And we, we practice here at this church what we call open communion. And what that really means is that if, you were, if you're not from a Baptist background, but you would have been offered communion in whatever background you're from, then we invite you to join us at the table as well. But Paul also gives a warning there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 
And he said that we must examine ourselves so that we don't eat and drink of the bread in an unworthy, unworthy manner. And if you're not sure about your relationship with Christ, there is a question in your heart about whether you died right now, you'd spend eternity in heaven with God. Then I just tell you just to, I would advise you just to let the plates pass. Let that between, be between you and the Lord as we come together to celebrate at this table. I'm going to ask the guys that would help me serve to, to come on up. And I'll read it again. Paul said this. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Father, we thank you for the bread, indicating your body broken for us, your willingness to not hold anything back but to share everything to include your life with us. And Father, we thank you for this memorial of your broken body on the cross. And Father, we pray that that's exactly what it would be we pray it in Jesus' name. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And Father, thank you for the new covenant a covenant that is built on grace, a covenant that is built on mercy. Father, you did not spare even your own son to buy us back. And Father, thank you for the spilled blood on the cross. Thank you that by his stripes we are healed. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Father, we know that you have offered that for us. And thank you for the gift of Christ and for his willingness to go to the cross for us. And we just pray this time would be a memorial of his blood shed, that it provides forgiveness in Jesus' name. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this bread, eat this bread and drink this cup, 
who proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Father, thank you for the opportunity to celebrate around this table, to proclaim your death until you come again. And Father, I pray as we enter these moments of invitation, and Father, maybe there's one here today that as we've talked about this or talked about how you've moved in hearts of your people, and Father, they realize that maybe they don't have a relationship with you. Father, would you continue to speak to them in these next few moments? Or your children that are here this morning, Father, maybe there are some areas of our lives we haven't been open, haven't been sharing, haven't been willing to give of ourselves. Father, would you, would you continue to impact hearts here in these next few moments and give us the boldness to respond to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And would you stand with us as we sing our hymn of invitation? This is your opportunity to respond to however the Lord has spoken to your heart this morning. speak with someone or pray with someone after the service. I'm available to do that. Our deacons are available to do that. Don't